all works out really well. Today I'm going to talk about very simply traits of an amazing woman. And here's what I want you to know. I'm very aware, like I said earlier in the service, that many people did not have an amazing mom. And, but every time that somebody's come to me and told me my mom was, and then they fill in the blank with whatever, non-existent, not there for me, abusive in some situations. And if that's true, I'm very sorry. But every time I say, was there a woman who showed you what a good mom was like? And every time, every time they've said yes. I haven't had one exception yet. And many times there are women that do not have children of their own. So if you're a mom, uh, that's awesome. But if you're home and you're not a mom and you're thinking, you know, but I'm not a mom. It's Mother's Day. Listen, we celebrate all our ladies on Mother's Day because I'm very aware that being a mom doesn't always make you a mom. And not being a mom doesn't not make you a mom. And so if you're home today, I want to encourage you. Be encouraged where you're at. Now, I actually, it was funny when I came in this morning. Oh, let me, let me do this real quick. I'm going to give you kind of the sermon in a sentence. And then we're going to get to uh, Exodus chapter 1. Uh, God's love for you is the same or more than amazing women. We have women in our lives that just show us a touch of God's love. And today as we talk about this idea of traits of amazing women, I want you to know, I want you to think about, whoever you are, that God loves you even more. Now, the staff and, and folks here today were very surprised. I keep using hand sanitizer because it's here. Um, we're very surprised that I still had this. Now, if you were born after the 80s, you have no idea what it's like to play with dangerous stuff. By the way, this is original. It still has a sticker from Wacky Packs. Do you remember Wacky Packs? And this is, uh, we visited Scenic Black Lagoon, and it has the Loch Ness Monster on here. Very Wacky Packy. But this is a Tonka car carrier. It actually came with three uh, cars. It's, only, it's down to two. And it actually opens and closes. It's totally metal. This is an amazing pinching device that they included in this. By the way, the truck has to be up here to open it. All right. This amazing pinching device. You can also put these on top, by the way. And so my brother and I, just to give you an idea of what it was like for us to be, ow, what it was like for us to be children, your kids will never play with these things. I mean, this, I mean, you could pound this. You know, we can't have anything dangerous. But this is cool. I used to even look inside there and imagine the guy driving that. And um, anyway, so when we were kids, we had a tile house. The whole house was tile downstairs. And so my brother and I, this will tell you how little we were. He had the exact same truck. My mom, my mom, he was just 14 months behind me. And my mom always tried to buy us the same thing. So we would put these trucks together. And we were small enough. I'm not going to be able to do it. We were small enough that we would actually climb on this truck. Our heads here, feet hanging off. And we would propel ourselves around the house and turn this and leave plastic wheel junk all over the top. My brother and I just chasing each other to see who could go faster around the whole downstairs of the house. Now, let me just say this to you. If you know my brother and I, you need to realize we have one of the greatest mothers on earth. Every once in a while, my mom will come up to me and she'll say these words. She'll say, Eric, I am really sorry. And then she'll name a story. <laughs> and here's what I say to her. Mom, you can't hurt it. You cannot hurt it. It can hurt you, but you can't hurt it. I said, Mom, here's the truth. I'm glad you didn't kill us. We, 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 you kept us alive through childhood. And my mom is a saint. I'm going to tell a few stories about that today. But it's just amazing to me how, uh, uh, even with all of our craziness, with five children. By the way, my mom was not supposed to have children. She adopted my older brother and sister, who I, I don't even think of that, because uh, they are family. My older brother and sister. And then she had three children. And I was surprise number two. And my dad actually, after she had me, said, if you'll lose weight, I'll buy you a Cadillac. So my mom lost the weight and then she got pregnant with my brother and he said, I'm never buying you another Cadillac, which was a lie because he did buy her another one. So here's what I want you to know first. Amazing women 
impact every child. And I'm going to read you a part of Exodus and a story I've never taught on in the 25 years. I've been a pastor of a church, 20, 20 years I've been a pastor of a church and been in youth ministry another five years on top of that. I've never taught on this. In the story of Moses, Moses, who wrote the story down, by the way, these were passed down by oral tradition. Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, which is called the Pentateuch. When Moses is writing this down, he purposefully includes two women, not just the women, not just what they did, but includes them by name. Because he knows if it wasn't for these two women, these two women that were not moms at the time, he would have never been born. So let me read this story to you. Here it goes. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, how's that for two names? Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, by the way, you can go. Archaeologists have pictures of this. It's horrible. You think childbirth is bad now. You should have seen. It was like a, they, had a, they had a birthing stone that was supposed to be brought from the gods. And they had this little cave kind of thing that they, they sat in. It was awful. So it says this. When you're on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill it. By the way, they also had a knife that they would lay on the mom's stomach as a sign of the gods. Uh, and this is what they did in Egypt. So killing the baby, you would cut the cord with that, but, but killing the baby would have been very simple. The midwives, however, it says, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. And then it continues, then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, I love this, Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women, they're vigorous. They give birth before the midwives arrive. They're like popping them out like rabbits, you know. Anyway, it doesn't say that in the Bible. That was just my, if you're not reading along. All right. So, so God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, listen to this. He gave them families of their own. So they didn't have families before this. They cared for other people's children. By the way, there's even a debate of whether these were Hebrew or Egyptian because of the original language. It's not really clear, and I'm not going to go into that today, but I tend to lean towards these actually being Egyptian women, but I have a whole different thing for that, and we don't have time to talk about that today. It has nothing to do with Mother's Day. But all that to say, these women did not have to obey Pharaoh. Or they, had, they were supposed to obey Pharaoh, and they didn't. They chose not to, at risk of their life. And then he says, then the Pharaoh gave this order, every Hebrew boy that is born must be thrown in the Nile, but let every girl live. So what Pharaoh said is, hey, I can't keep track of what you're doing in private, so we're going to throw them in the Nile, and they believe that the Nile was connected to their gods. We're going to throw them in the Nile. That way I can see them. Can you imagine how horrible that had to be? I mean, during this time, can you imagine? Because this happened over and over and over again. And yet these two women did not do what they were told to do. How do I know that? Because of what happens next. So today we're going to talk about traits of an amazing mom. And number one is this. She puts her child's needs before her own. Now, many of you may or may not know that my father, when I was in college, after my first year of college, took his own life. And so I remember it was between years of school and I remember thinking, well, I guess I'm going to stay home, you know, and help mom with whatever. We had just sold our house. There was all, there was nowhere for us to live. I mean, it was just chaos, absolute chaos. And my mom said, no, I want you boys to go back to school. And she made sure not only that we went back to school, but that we had money and were provided for as we went back to school. I look back now and I think I can imagine, cannot imagine what she had to go through when her 55-year-old husband suddenly in June of 1988, 87, took his life. I can't imagine what she went through that summer. I can't imagine what she went through as it went next year. It was chaos. Just two days ago, I learned of a pastor of a very large church in America who took his own life just days before Mother's Day. 
He's got several children and a wife. And so today, as Mother's Day comes, I can't even imagine what he's walking through. And so I just thought, you know, this morning I'm going to pray for that wife and pray for those kids because I know what it feels like. And yet in the middle of that, my mom put everything before her own needs. Listen to what it says here. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi, his name was Amram. You got to admit that's a cool name. Amram. What's your name? Amram. Married a Levite woman, Jochebed. By the way, it points out that they're Levite women. Levites would eventually become the priest, if you remember. And so it was showing that, that Moses' heritage was a pastoral heritage. They were the shepherds of the flock. And of course, Moses became a literal shepherd of the flock a little bit later. And he gave birth to a son. And I love this. When she saw he was a fine child. By the way, Moses is writing this. So I just love this idea that he described himself as a fine child. I don't, I don't know, you know, uh, 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 what he was saying here, but he's like, you know, I was a good looking baby. And then he says, she hid him for three months. You think a month of quarantine has been bad, have three months with a baby that if it's found out, if it cries outside of your straw hut and somebody hears it, your child will be killed. Imagine three months, night and day of hiding and trying to hide a baby. But she gave up everything for that. You talk about not going outside, not going to the movies, not going to see a friend, not going to a restaurant, not going and getting a haircut, not getting your hair done or anything else. Three months, she sacrificed everything for baby Moses. In Hebrews 11, it says it this way, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months. And after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. They said, you know what, if I need to die, that's okay. We're going to save this child. My first prayer today is this for you. Father, thank you for a mom. And then I said, or a mom who put my needs first. Because some of you did not have a biological mom that put your needs first. But my prayer is that somebody in your life, a mom, put your needs first. Number two, she trusts God with her child. So she she puts her child's needs before her own, and she trusts God with her child. I'll never forget when Ricky was in ICU weeks and weeks sitting at the lake by Florida Hospital near downtown Orlando. And after a few weeks, and they said he was getting worse, sitting by the lake and saying, God, thank you for a few weeks of having a child. If you want to take him home, you can take him home. But if you would let me have him, I promise to take care of him. That boy is going to be graduating this month. Barring some kind of anti-miracle, he will be graduating this month. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean walking in graduation. That's going to happen probably next month. I can't imagine what it was like for this next part of the story. But I want to give you a principle of life. And that is that you're steward. You're a steward. You're in charge of everything God's given you, but it's not yours. He's put you in charge of it. So your children really are his. And you have to think of them that way. You have to think, God, these are your children. What do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? I'm a caretaker for you. What do you want me to do? Exodus 2, 3 and 4 says this. But when she could hide him no longer. You know what that means, right? He's moving around way too much. She got a papyrus basket and coated it with tar and pitch. Which is interesting because papyrus is what they ended up writing on. If you remember, that was what they ended up making you know, parchment on. She got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. I'm assuming that's on the outside. Otherwise, Moses would have been really dirty. <laughs> she placed the child in it. And then she put him among the reeds on the bank of the Nile. Can you imagine? With animals and alligators. I don't know if there's crocodiles in the Nile. There's bad animals, I can tell you that. And taking your child and saying, God, I can no longer hide him. Please take care of my child. Now, let me tell you something about this basket. 
It continues and it says, his sister, who we find out later's name's Miriam, stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. So she said, Miriam, go watch. Go watch and see what happens. So Miriam followed the basket down the Nile, just kind of at a distance along the banks of the Nile, watching. Is it going to get eaten? Is, it gonna, is, the, is the basket going to go underwater? What's going to happen? Now, we know the end of the story, so we don't even worry about that. But imagine being a mom who's hid your child for months, and now you say, I can't hide him anymore. I'm going to have to let him go. Now, let me give you the symbolism of that. In your life, we hang on to things really tight. We think things are ours. We pray for our children. We worry about our children. We worry about other people. We get frustrated by circumstances. We get frustrated when somebody attacks us. We get frustrated when somebody files a lawsuit against us. We get frustrated when we go to the doctor and he says, oh, this is what's happening. Or we take somebody else to the doctor and they say they're going to need surgery. And we worry and we stress and we plead with God. And you know what we have to do sometimes? God, I'm going to place all my worries, all my fears, all my doubts, and let you have them. Now, I'll be honest with you, that had to be a lot easier than letting Moses go. And when we trust God and we realize everything I have is his, you can take this basket and say, God, it's yours. Maybe you have a wayward child. Maybe you have a child that you're not sure is going to come back to God. Maybe you're worried about your child because you see decisions they're making. Maybe you're worried about a parent. Maybe you're worried about a loved one. Maybe you're worried about a circumstance. Put it in the basket and send it down the Nile. But, but Eric, if I don't worry about it, something might go wrong. Guess what? Something might go wrong anyway. Sometimes you just have to give it back to God. The next prayer is this. Lord, help me to trust my children and others, and or others, to your care. Number three, so she puts her child's needs before her own. She trusts God with her child. Number three, she sacrifices for her child. Now, a week and a half ago, Kristen was working late at the hospital. She was working until about 10 o'clock. She's been doing that all week. This week, again, working with COVID patients. And one night she came home and it was about 10 o'clock and I was exhausted. All I could think was, I'm ready for bed, but I wanted to greet her coming in the door. So, so I greeted her coming in the door and I thought, it's time for bed. And our daughter says, mom, I need help with homework. Now you got to realize as a dad, you know what my response would have been? Can I just be honest? Well, YouTube might be able to help you right now, but dad isn't. But Kristen went after working all day, working late into the night, sat at the table, wasn't frustrated, didn't get upset, sat down at the table and for over an hour went through, I believe it was biology homework and talked line by line, page by page in the virtual book. You know, they don't have real books anymore. And talked about it. Why? She sacrificed her own comfort and convenience for a child. By the way, all of these things are just a touch of what God does for you. You realize that, right? When we look at great moms, this is just an example of, a, of, a, of just a piece of what God does for us. Just, a, just Listen, the most loving you could ever be for your child and the most loving somebody could ever be for you is just a grain of sand on the beach of God's love for you. He loves you more than you can imagine. And by the way, sometimes <laughs> God even lets us <laughs> go like the prodigal father. It continues in Exodus 2, 7 through 10. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go? Okay, so you remember the story. What do they do? They, the, the Pharaoh's daughter finds the basket, right? Brings it up and says, look, the gods brought me a baby. Now she had to know with all these babies floating down the Nile that that wasn't true. But you know what? This one was in a basket. Floated right up to her. And she said, the gods have brought me a baby. So then Miriam comes up and says, hey, uh, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? I mean, I have this idea. Now, Miriam is smart. Later on in the Bible, she causes a little bit of trouble. But Miriam is smart. Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. She got Jochebed. 
Imagine what that moment was like when Miriam, who had been watching the basket, watching the basket, watching the basket, ran up and said, hey, uh, how about if I get somebody to nurse that baby for you? And she's like, that's a great idea. Can you imagine Miriam, the sister, running home? Imagine Jochebed at home just praying, God, take care of my child. And Miriam comes in and goes, hey, Pharaoh's daughter has found your baby and wants you to nurse it. Blah. And by the way, they have the name Moses now because he was drawn out of the water. Hope he didn't like his original name. I'm good with whatever name you want to give him. You notice you don't hear his other name. Why? Because mom didn't care. She was so glad he's alive. She's like, name whatever you want. So the girl went and got the baby's mother, Pharaoh's daughter, and said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So Pharaoh's daughter actually talked to her and said, hey, take this baby and I'll pay you. So now she's going to get paid to nurse her own baby. That's how good God is, by the way. When you give something up to him, he makes it even better. When you hang on to it, it just gets bad. But when you let go, guess what? He, he fixes it. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. Now you think giving up the first time was bad? Listen to this. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter. We don't know how old. We're, we're assuming maybe two or three at this point. Took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. She was willing to sacrifice so that her child could live. She said, I would love to raise this child. I'm sure she had thoughts of running away with Moses and, and figuring out a way. How can we get away? What can we do? And then she realized, you know what? He's going to grow up in the palace. And because she sacrificed the second time, you know what? One of the first cultures that started writing and started keeping libraries was this group called the Egyptians. And so in Pharaoh's God-laden temples, Moses would learn how to write. He would learn how to make papyrus. He would learn how to find ink. He would learn how to write so that other people could read it. And guess what? Because of Jochebed's sacrifice and the sacrifice of the women who were midwives and because of his sister going out of her way, and all of these people, we now have the first five books, at least, of the Old Testament. From this guy named Moses. You never know when you say, God, I'm going to trust you with this problem, with this insecurity, with this child, with this struggle, with this habit, with this addiction. You never know when you give it to God how God is going to use it in the future. And that very thing that you think you have lost and given up, God may use to make a huge difference, not just in other people's lives, but all around the world. Thank you, Lord, for women who sacrificed to make me the person you wanted me to be. For those of you who know me, you know I'm a very distracted, frustrating, and, and some days I come and have a conversation with somebody and, and interrupt them 42 times. And when I walk away, I think, oh, I can't believe I did that again. And I'm older now. It must have been so frustrating when I was eight years old to even try to get a word in. When we were riding these things around the house and scratching up her good floor, my mom would just say, you're so quick. Your mind just moves so fast. Where other parents would have said, just be quiet. Just sit over in the corner. Just leave me alone. My mom said, you know, I'm so proud of you. You're able to figure out anything. What she meant was I was taking apart everything. She looked and saw the good and sacrificed her desires for me. Listen. If you're watching today, I want you to know God's love for you, that is just a touch of his love for you. And if you don't have a relationship with him, I'd love to talk to you online about what it means to know him. John 3.16 says it very simply, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. 
that whoever believes in him, that means put your faith in him, will not die, but will have eternal life. If you're ready to trust God, and just like I'm putting my faith in this chair, if you're ready to trust him, you can do that today. I have a final prayer I'm going to pray for all our moms and for those who are watching. And then we're going to let our praise team close. If you need prayer, if you want to give your life to Christ and you want to talk online, just send me a note, send me an email, send me a text. Our number for the church is online. You can even text that number and we'll get in touch with you. Let's say this prayer that I have on our notes. Father, thank you for the importance you placed on women. Thank you that the women who were your followers were the first to proclaim the message of your resurrection. Thank you for the example of the mother of Moses. Father, bless those who had moms that were not an example of your love and give them forgiveness. Bless those today who are missing their moms. Thank you, Father, that you always comfort those who wanted to be moms on Mother's Day. Thank you for the ladies who act as moms to so many who are not their biological children. Father, help us to value and appreciate all women as you do. Help us to honor every woman on this special day. And Lord, I want to thank you that your love is so much greater than even the best mom in the world. May we today know your love and may it flow from us onto other people. In Jesus' name, amen.